Rocky or Alamans, something along those lines. You're 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 Dutch, sure. you said, so I'm not going to get <laughs> yeah. your name right. But tell us again your name properly pronounced, and then uh, who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So sorry, it's a it's a Dutch name. So uh, we would pronounce it as Melchior Almans, uh, okay. but you, you did pretty well. So okay. uh, I tried. You got an eight out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I'm based in the, in the Netherlands. I'm actually close to Amsterdam. So uh, and and I work for Juniper Networks as a consulting engineer. Mm -hmm. So my role is to um, uh, talk about our technology, uh, bring back um, uh, questions and challenges our customers have and, and try to solve them uh, either with our engineering folks or come up with the solutions. Now, I had reached out to you because I was doing some homework on TCP AO. I, it maybe it was an article you wrote, something like that, but I had found this topic and discovered that one of its primary use cases, maybe the primary use case, was as a replacement for BGP MD5 authentication. Let's start with some background. Give us the uh, maybe a little history. How did TCP AO get started? Why does it, what's the point of it? Why did we need to replace BGP MD5? Uh, or were there other use cases, perhaps, that we should be talking about that drove it? Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, I've, I've talked quite a, a bit about TCP AO, uh, wrote some blogs as well. So great that, that you've noticed. Um, so yeah, so uh, as you might know, MD5 was deprecated like 10 years ago, right? So uh, we as industry figured that MD5 wasn't really that secure as, as we figured um, as an authentication protocol. Um, and so a couple of folks, including uh, Ron Bonica, came up with the idea to, um, let's say, uh, uh, write an RFC for an MD5 successor, which was called the TCP authentication option. Um, and that RFC was actually published uh, in uh, June 2010. Uh, it's RFC 5925. Um, however, until uh, a couple of years ago, no one really started using it. Why? Because MD5 probably was just good enough, right? It, it just worked. Um, and um, no one has actually implemented the code. Um, and it's really hard <laughs> to use something. <laughs> I mean, I would have been standing up authenticated BGP <laughs> sessions in 2010, and I didn't even know TCPAO was a thing. And as you say, there were no implementations. It's not like you were looking at router documentation, and it gave you that as a as a recommended better choice because, again, no one had written the code. Right, right. There's quite a few RFCs, including uh, uh, recent uh, RPKI RFCs that mentioned that you should use TCPAO for securing uh, RPKI RTR sessions. Um, however, if there's no production code, then obviously no one will start using it. So uh, the good news is that by now, uh, three major routing vendors, uh, that's being Cisco, uh, Nokia, and Juniper, have uh, done the code. And so it's available in production releases. Um, there also has been some testing. Um, uh, there's, there's some examples you can find on the TCP-AO GitHub uh, page for configuration examples. Um, but we're now at a point where there's three vendors that have implemented it, but there's no open source implementation, right? So you can still cannot use it on your favorite open source uh, BGP daemon. Fair um, enough. Um, yeah. it, are the three vendors that have implemented Cisco, Juniper, and Nokia, are those interoperable? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. So that's been tested, that, that works. Um, um, uh, so if you are in a BGP peering session with uh, one of the three vendors, and you have one of the three vendors on, on the other side, then you can definitely run TCP AO uh, to authenticate the TCP session uh, underneath the BGP session. And so that, that works. Um, the thing is, what I mentioned, there's no open source implementation yet, right? Mm -hmm. So you cannot use it on your favorite route server, whether that's Bird or OpenBGPD or any of the other open source implementations. So the, the good thing is that there is now uh, a grant from RIPE and from uh, Internet Society uh, to actually get the open source work done. Um, so I expect that to be available uh, later this year. So sometime in 2022, we may well see open source yeah. implementation. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there has okay. been some, some projects. There has been some work uh, done over the uh, past couple of years, but uh, again, no production code yet. Um, but I definitely expect that to be available later this year. Hmm. 
Now, I spent a little bit of time in the lab working on a Cisco flavor, Cisco IOS XR, and uh, fiddled with TCPAO. It was to find a key and then use that key in a keychain and uh, bring that keychain into the BGP process, and uh, and off you go. It was more or less that something that folks that are familiar with the Cisco IOS command line would have seen similar kinds of things for router authentication and other use cases for keys and keychains. Uh, you're going to show us in Junos, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I've created a small lab. Let me share my screen in the meantime. Um, you should see that now. So this is a lab consisting of two uh, of uh, Juniper's uh, virtual routers. Um, let me quickly show you the configuration. It, it's a really basic configuration. Um, we have a uh, interface uh, configured on both sides, uh, and we have some uh, default routing options, and we have a uh, BGP session between uh, the two routers. Same, uh, obviously, on the uh, on the other side. And now it's very straightforward. They can find each yeah. other with uh, yeah. with a default yeah. route. Uh, we've got a BGP AS of thirty four five sixty two, and they are peered to each other. Yeah, yeah. And as you can see, the session is established. Um, so if you look at the uh, session details, I won't go through everything, but uh, you'll notice that there is no authentication configured. And that is what you can see here in the, uh, on, on the right side in the, in the configuration part as well. So this is just a really simple, clear um, a BGP session. I haven't configured any import or export uh, policies uh, because it's just these two boxes uh, connected back to back. And as you can see, they're not advertising anything. Um, so, um, uh, nothing really special there. Um, so what we uh, want to do, as you already mentioned, what we need, and, and I'll, I'll copy paste some stuff in to speed up the process a little bit, um, is that we indeed need a, a keychain, uh, mm -hmm. which I, uh, for in this example, I, I uh, named it, uh, AO AES chain because we're using AES, um, uh, for the, for authenticating the session. Um, we need to configure, obviously, a key, and uh, as uh, which differs with MD5 is that we can actually configure a start time, and that is mm. uh, uh, the, the reason why we need to configure that start time is because TCPAO allows for uh, hitless key wall over. That's one of the biggest differences as with uh, MD5. That is, we don't have to tear down the BGP session to roll the key over? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we all know this example of someone who ever configured the network and brought up the PGP session with the neighbor on the IXP. He left uh, three years ago. Uh, the session is still up. No one knows the key, uh, but we cannot really change it because the session cannot go down, etc. Right. So right. that is what AO tries to cater for, um, that you ex can actually roll over the key at a certain point uh, in time. Um, so the, the next step is that we need to choose an algorithm. Uh, that's obviously TCPAO. Uh, we configure some attributes, which is a send ID and a receive ID. Uh, and when <laughs> this is a funny story. When testing with Greg Hankins from Nokia, we couldn't bring the session up because we forgot to switch the send ID and the receive ID keys on both sides. So we tried to send and receive uh, the same ID. That obviously doesn't uh, so work. So what is that doing? Is that uh, assigning a number to the pe to the the peers that are participating in the key exchange? Uh, no, that is uh, so. Th the thing is, from the secret uh, that is the master key tuple, you derive the traffic keys, and traffic keys are generated uh, uh, out of the of a TCP port number, etc. And you need to choose uh, which uh, traffic key you're going to use to send and receive. Hmm. Um, so you need to obviously switch that if you expect uh, to receive uh, ID9, but you configure send ID9 on both sides, then, well, you see the problem happening. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously we want the TCP AO option uh, to be enabled. This basically uh, flips the switch in the TCP header saying this uh, segment is authenticated using TCP AO. Uh, and we need to use a cryptographic algorithm. Uh, and this is also another difference as with MD5, where obviously you only have MD5. In TCPAO, uh, you can actually choose which algorithm to use. Um, so we've, we've pasted that on our VMX1. Uh, let's also paste the same uh, configuration on, uh, on VMX2. Um, there is no 
different so far, except as I mentioned from switching the send and receive uh, key IDs. As you would expect, yeah, okay. And okay. other than that, they're identical. And all we've done so far is create a, uh, a keychain and then a key within that keychain. It hasn't been applied to the BGP session yet. So it's there ready for us to use, but nothing's so changed it, with BGP. Yeah, so if we would configure this part of the configuration, nothing happens to your BGP session. <clears throat> the part that will change your uh, BGP session is what I'll paste in uh, right now. That is these last two uh, lines which basically says that for uh, this neighbor's uh, BGP session, uh, we want to use authentication algorithm TCP AO, and we want to use the keychain uh, AO AES chain, and that is exactly the one uh, we configured here. Um, so if we now do again a show uh, BGP summary, we see that the session is established. So let's commit on router one, the configuration we just pasted in and see what happens. Well, obviously, the session is now so, in, in. Yeah, now the session should go down. One side's attempting to right. authenticate, the other right. side, we haven't configured authentication right. yet. And so right. it's trying. The router on the right hand side, your VMX2, is trying. He's trying to connect, but that's not going to be allowed because he's not appearing with the correct uh, credentials in this case. Right. Well, he's, he's not even participating in AO, right? So he, yeah. he hasn't set the, the bit in, uh, in the TCP header. Hmm. Um, so, so as you can see here, the, the session, uh, uh, as we mentioned, has gone down, obviously. Um, so now let's configure uh, also our VMX router too. Uh, and as you can see, these are uh, the same comments. So we uh, choose an authentication algorithm, TCPAO, and the uh, keychain. Uh -huh. And now if we commit uh, this part of the uh, configuration and we look at the session again, we see it has gone up it's two damaged. seconds ago. Yeah. yeah. And now on the other side, the interesting thing is that we can see that we are using an authentication keychain and an authentication algorithm. Um, so now our uh, BGP session is uh, authenticated using uh, TCP AO. Now the session is authenticated with TCP AO. If I were to look at the BGP data stream flowing between the routers in Wireshark, is, uh, are, are the packets uh, uh, changed in other ways as well? Is uh, the session encrypted? Is what do we see? Well, so no, it's authentication, right? It's not right. encryption. Um, so that's the big difference, for example, for, uh, if doing uh, BGP over IPsec, then it would encrypt the session because it's in the IPsec tunnel. In this case, it is authenticating. So we are sure or we can assume that the one we're peering with is the one we are intended to or it, it's our intention to peer with. Um, so that is what authentication does. Um, the other thing what both MD5 and TCP AO do is obviously protect the session against TCP header attacks. Right? If you're in an IXP environment and you're on a, on a layer two segment, uh, someone else who would maybe um, intentional or intention unintentional tries to interfere with our session could start sending uh, packets to one of the two routers. Um, but uh, uh, because the, the MAC, uh, the message authentication key cannot be calculated if that third party is not using the right um, uh, the, the, the right uh, authentication, uh, the packet is dropped. Right. So obviously, it, it takes lots of time uh, if you would want to bring a TCP session down like that because you need to guess the right sequence number, etc. There's more involved. But um, um, so both uh, MD5 and TCP AO uh, would protect against uh, replay attacks or TCP header attacks as well. Um, so that's the second advantage of do it, of authenticating a BGP session. How heavy is this code for the control plane CPU? Are we going to notice much of a hit? No, no, no. It's uh, it's comparable as with MD5. Okay. Um, and I've personally, I, I don't have any lab numbers at hand, but I've personally never experienced uh, control plane issues using uh, MD5. I wouldn't have expected, but... It's worth asking the question. Right, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, so it's, it's in that perspective, it's, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a hit on, on CPU performance. And to come back to your question, if you would uh, do a performer wire shark on, on the wire uh, between our two routers, um, then you would be able to see that the uh, TCP AO um, bit is actually set in the, in the TCP header. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that is what you could capture. Uh, and also, obviously, if the session uh, doesn't establish, uh, in our cases, what we've seen, the BGP session won't establish, then if you would do a packet capture, you would see that SINs would be sent, but there wouldn't be an egg, right? Because mm. the other side isn't able to uh, calculate the, the correct MAC over that segment, so it won't send an egg back. One final question then. We've demonstrated this using BGP, but this is TCP AO. It is not unique to BGP necessarily. So in theory, are there other use cases for TCP AO? Yeah, yeah. So the other thing, um, uh, I'm not sure for Nokia and Cisco, but we've uh, implemented it for LDP as well. Um, but basically, you could use it to protect any long-lasting uh, TCP session. Um, in the beginning of the conversation, we mentioned the RPKI RTR, for example. That is another example of a long-lasting TCP session. Um, so you could use TCP AO to authenticate that as well. Um, it's it's for sure not bound to uh, BGP, right? It it rely it it runs on the TCP uh, layer. Um, so whatever runs on TCP doesn't matter for AO. Um, it's just that uh, BGP is obviously the the most widely used uh, or most widely implemented use case. Very good. Now, if folks want to contact you because they have follow up questions about this. Is that uh, is that possible? You got some yeah, way you like people sure. to reach out to you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can send me an email, that's melchior at juniper.net, um, or as I said, find me on any of the social channels. Um, we're also starting a website, which is uh, tcp-ao.net, uh, to provide information about the uh, open source implementation. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. This was great stuff, Melchior. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 